Well, if you missed it last week, we had Corey Christensen with us, and she shared um, about the essentials for Christian community, how to live healthily in Christian community. And today we get to move forward in the book of Exodus to one of the, like aside from the whole Red Sea, like delivering from Egypt, walking on dry land through a sea thing, like <clears throat> the story of God giving the Ten Commandments to his people, kind of a big deal. You may have heard about it. And <clears throat> depending on the tradition of religion you've come up from, may paint the lens or paint the lens. You can't paint a lens. It may shape the way in which you view those, right? Like depending on your type of church, what kid's storybook Bible, what your parents said about these things, if faith was even a part of your upbringing, um, this, this chunk of the Ten Commandments can ha- take on many different shapes for us uh, in our worldview. And so today, what we're going to do is we're going to really peel back the layers a bit and look at what this means for us and what it was actually saying to the people of this time so that we can actually understand it. Um, but first, there's a couple things we need to know leading into it. We're not going to read through it all, but in chapter 19 is where this week kind of, kind of picks up. But what's going on is this is a point in time where we've been seeing God speak to his people through the mediator, through Moses, right? Like everything is like, Moses, go tell them this. And then they complain, and then he tells them again, and they complain, and he uses his staff to do something, right? To show them that like, no, see, this is God. But this is a point in time where God actually enters in, and he speaks directly to the people, So in chapter 19, it unpacks the dynamics and the setup of that because God is holy, but he's choosing to come meet with them. And it talks about some of the, you could call them ceremonial aspects of this this encounter. Um, But this is the first time that we see uh, God speak directly to the people. And they were so awestruck and overwhelmed that by the end of it, they're like, can Moses just talk to us? This is really overwhelming. (laughs) Um, it's kind of like maybe the owner of you, the business you work for comes to tell you something. Like, Can my manager just tell me that? Because like, you're really scary. So like, the Bible talks about how they were, they were awestruck, and it was just really overwhelming to them to where they're like, hey, can, you just, can, can Moses be the one to, to, to deliver this to us? Um, but it was, it was an encounter in which God himself engaged in relationship with his people, which is important because as we read through these commandments, it is initiated with a relationship, with a personal encounter. And so to, to remove that from the lens in which we view the rest of these would just, it would, we'd be missing something. So we need to know, like, oh, God took the time to engage his people to give these. Like, this is something about his relationship with them and their relationship with each other that is important here from the very get-go, from the very get-go. Um, and another thing before we launch into them is in chapter 20, verse 2, it says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So right away, right away, we see he's painting this through a gospel lens too. Like, hey, I'm not putting this on you because I want you to be my robots and just obey everything I say. Like, remember, I am good. I'm the God who has provided in, for you and redeemed like your story, brought you out of slavery already. So the stage is set for, hey, I desire to be in relationship with you. I'm going to meet you here and share these things with you. But also remember, like, remember what I've done. You guys had some pretty cruddy circumstances. I brought you out of that. Now, here is the way in which you can healthily relate with me, God, and with others. Like, that's what he's saying here. Um, So I I can kind of loosely equate it to some other scenarios that we run into in life. Um, If we think about rules of the road, right? Like nobody likes all those signs that tell you how fast to go and, oh, you need to take this turn at this speed and you need to do this and you need to do that. Like, why why can't they just let me drive? Why do they got to be all riding on me with all these rules and being all legalistic, right? Just let me, I know how to drive. Just let me drive. But when we think about like, what is the intention behind these actual rules of the road and these laws for drivers? It's so that people can like interact on the roadway in a safe manner and in some way care for one another, not put each other in danger, make sure that everyone can go point A to point B with the least amount of interference and you know, not like hit one another with their cars and kill people and, and stuff like that. So as much as like we may get angry at a police officer for pulling us over for doing 85 and a 55, <clears throat> what he's actually doing is he's trying to keep that 
atmosphere, that scenario, those situations, these roads, a safe place where people can interact with one another in an orderly and safe fashion, right? Like, you guys get what I'm saying here? It's not just about cops want to make money, they're really mean, and so if you go 30 over the speed limit, they just want to have rules to bring you down. Like, that's, that's not necessarily the heart of these kinds of environments. And I think we can find a lot of ways, whether it's in a school, whether it's at our job, um, that there's these kind of guidelines to help us to relate or exist in a certain environment well and healthily with one another. And that is the lens for these Ten Commandments. So many people come into the faith or maybe are raised up in the faith with just like, God just has a lot of rules. And he doesn't like care about, he just wants to squelch my fun. He doesn't care about what makes me happy. He just wants me to be his little robot living by all these rules all the time. But what he's actually doing here with these Ten Commandments is he's saying, hey, With the first four, he's saying, hey, here's how you can relate to me well. Like, thinking of being in relationship with the creator God and loving him and doing that in some kind of way that he's going to receive, that's kind of overwhelming, right? Like, how can I live in a way that's going to honor you, glorify you, respect you, and be relationally healthy? And and God's response to that is, let me give you some guidelines. Let me give you these commandments to to show you how to be relationally healthy with me. And then moving forward, the final six of these Ten Commandments are, here's how you relate well with one another. Because we know that God has a heart to love him, for us to love him, and love one another, to love others. It's not just about the vertical relationship. It's not just about the horizontal relationships. It's about all of it. And so we have to view these commandments through that lens as we go forward. It's what does this look like to be relationally healthy in the context of these commands? And that's what we're going to take a look at today. Something also to note is that the final six of these commands, there's other government and faith structures all over the world that have these kind of rules, right? Like do not murder, don't steal, these kind of things we're going to talk about. But no other faith structure, government, or organization in the world has these first four. These first four are what set Christianity apart, or the relational aspect of God with his creation. And so this is, this is important because not only is this like how we can relate, But this sets, like, following Jesus and being in relationship with God apart from all other faith structures and government organizational structures. So this is important. This is important. So we're going to take a look at what we can learn about God from each one of these. Does that sound good? So there's 10. It'll be good, and we'll, we'll pop through them. But you can open your Bible or your app, whatever you have, to chapter 20. And we're going to be in verses 3 through 17. Before we get going, let me pray for us. Dad, I thank you for this time. I thank you for your word. God, I pray that you would speak to us and bring revelation on what it looks like to be healthy uh, relationally with you and with others. Uh, Would you open up our hearts to your truth? And would you help these things not to just be something here on a Sunday, but something that can be applied in our lives, that can enrich our lives and help, help us to bring hope, not just in our situation, but in the situation of others. So we thank you. Uh, Be with us in this time. Amen. All right, so first commandment, verse three. It's pretty short. It says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. Super short, but there's a lot packed in there. So to understand the implications of that, we need to know like the spiritual climate or atmosphere that these people were operating in, right? Like God's telling them this for a reason. If we don't know why or what they're engaged in, we can't fully understand what's going on here. So he's combating three worldviews or belief systems here right off the bat. He's setting the stage. And what, he's, what he knows is <clears throat> there's, there's three things aside from believing in him and following him that, that these people are doing, the Egyptians and Israelites slip in and out of. And the first one just straight up is atheism. Like atheism would be the lack of belief in God or any gods. This is something that some people held this belief system. And inherent in saying, you shall have no other gods before me, that's not just like, If you want to believe in a God, he's just saying, no, like me, I'm God, I'm the creator, I am Yahweh, don't believe in anything else, it's just me, I am the true, the true way. The second thing that's interesting is he's addressing something called pantheism here. Pantheism, what that is, is equating God or gods to the universe, or a belief that the universe is some manifestation of God. Now, remember when we went through the plagues, we saw that... People worshipped the river. People worshipped all these different aspects of life as if they were God or they were a representation of God or that they were to be worshipped themselves. And this idea of pantheism is that like 
God is like this harmonious universal presence and like the river is like a manifestation of God and all these different things. And as we've read through Exodus, I'm, hopefully you guys have been paying attention you can see like, yeah, there was a lot of that going on, wasn't there? Like, why did they turn the Nile to blood? Because that was a God they worshiped for provision and all these other things. And he's like, no, I am the true God. This is now blood. That thing you worship that runs through your entire country. <clears throat> so he's addressing that worldview as well. And then the other one we see that he's addressing is this idea of polytheism, multiple gods. So like we said, as we were going through the plagues, again, there was 80-something gods in the structure of the Egyptians' worship. And God's saying, no, all that stuff, that's garbage. Like, I am the true God. You shall have no other gods before me. Let me keep it simple for you. Don't figure out which one to worship which day. Don't figure out which one's going to get you this and get you that. It's just me. All the other stuff, no good, okay? And he's starting right off the bookend, the front bookend of this entire encounter with his people. He's reminding them that I am Yahweh. I am the one who created all of this, and you shall worship no one before me. <clears throat> this is important because everybody worships something, right? Even if you call yourself an atheist, there's something that you're worshiping. There's something that you're giving your time, your adoration, your, your reverence to. Everybody worships something. And this concept of idolatry is putting someone or something in the place that God should have. And whether it was their provision or whether it was their family or their livestock or whatever universal things were happening with Egypt and with, with the people of Israel, we saw that they often mistook things of the world to be worshipped instead of God. <clears throat> and the thing about idols is often... In our context, we think that like an idol is just some golden calf moment, which we'll read about soon enough, or that it's, oh, maybe I idolize my car, I idolize my fiance, or, or this or that. But <clears throat> this concept of idols isn't just something that's physical, it's something that happens in our heart. And we see as God goes through this, he continues to address the issues of our heart. It's not just like, hey, don't build a statue. It's like, no, 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 don't give your worship like your hope and all these things to something that's not me. And he addresses this from the very beginning. From the very start of this list, God's want, God wants us to see that like, no, he's God. Get rid of those idols, repent and move forward, like knowing who he is and following him. Because only he can satisfy the desires of our heart. Only he can satisfy those. And through this, he reminds us, I've got a slide for this, that there are phony substitutes that will court our souls in this world, right? Phony substitutes for worship that will court our souls. But don't settle. But don't settle. Things are going to present them to themselves to you guys and to us as like, oh, that's attractive. That looks fun. That looks like that would be pleasing. That looks like that could provide for me. But those are phony substitutes for God. And he's encouraging us in this. Don't settle. It's me. It's God. It's Yahweh. Don't settle for all that other phony stuff. So that's the first one. That's how he starts this off. Second one, verses four through six. It says, you shall not make yourself a carved image of any likeness of anything that's in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So again, it's, it's obviously a pretty big deal that we don't have false objects of worship, that we know who, who gets the glory, who is the creator God. Um, he reminds us that all these things are powerless. But here we see something for the first time. It says, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. <clears throat> this is the first mention in the entire Bible of God being loving. Throughout Exodus, it's implied, right? It's like, oh, that's a loving thing to do. And for those of us who you've maybe heard messages or read other parts of the Bible, oh, God is love. We know that's on pillows in all our grandmother's houses, right? Like God's love. So like we know that God is equated to love, but this is the first time that like he actually addresses them in a manner saying, no, I'm going to show steadfast love. That's who I am. And it's not like, hey, Moses, tell them I love them. 
Tell him I love him. It's like, no, I will show steadfast love. Like, he is speaking this himself. For the first time in the Bible, love and God are equated in his words, and he delivers that message of himself explicitly. So going forward, we know that a loving God is foundational for everything else we're reading. This is foundational. And everything becomes a spillover of that heart, believing that he is loving. Believing that he is loving. Verse 7 is our third commandment. It says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. It's important that we take this in part to fully understand it. Because often people just like equate this to like, don't lie, okay? Just don't lie. Or not this one. Um, Don't take my name in vain. People think it's just about swearing, right? Like, oh, don't swear. Don't say that one thing that's like really dishonoring to God. But this is about the name of God. It doesn't just simply mean Lord or Yahweh. It has to do what's connected to the name. It says those who would take my name. It's about the essence of God. So there's, you know, my name is Chris. But like, what is it about Chris that encompasses that name? Please don't answer, that's rhetorical. Um, but there's things attached to like your life experience and, and things about that person's essence, who they are, um, what they bring to the table, you know, past, present, future type of stuff. Like there's something more with a name than just like, oh yeah, that's five letters, it starts with a C. Um, there's, there's something more to the name here. It focuses on his essence. And this tells us that he is to be highly valued. He is worthy of the highest honor. So what does it mean to take his name? Now we know like the name is important. That's important. But to take his name does not simply mean to speak it. It means to carry or bear his name. What does it mean to be a bearer of the name of God, of the name of Yahweh? People who have publicly declared to take on the name of God are called to do that with honor and dignity, and integrity, because we bear his name. There's also an element of not taking his name and bearing false witness to it, right? Like, the things that come out of our mouths should align with the character of God and who he is. They should align with that. This might happen in corporate worship, say, where there's words on the screen, and you're... You're mouthing those words, and you're going for it, and you see people around you have their hands raised. You're like, well, I'll give them one, and you're saying the words, but in your mind and in your heart, there's nothing about your relationship with God happening. There is nothing that you are doing to actually direct your heart towards him. You're just engaging in some religious expression in the moment. As a Christian, we we are representatives of his name. We bear his name, and when we use it, we are to glorify him and to bear witness to who he is, what he's done in our lives, and express ourselves in that manner. His reputation is attached to us, is another way to think about it. God's reputation is attached to us as we take his name, as we take his name. And as a result of that, we ought to live for him in his glory. We can't take it lightly that we are name bearers of God. And we are responsible to bear true witness to who he is, what he does for us, and his meaning in our lives. Taking on his name means that his reputation is attached to us. And we can't take that lightly, friends. Like, that's something that <clears throat> it cannot be minimized to don't say this phrase or don't say this word. It is about the way in which we represent the true living God who we say we follow. Amen? All right, number four, verses eight through 11. Remember the Sabbath day and to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy." So we see that he's referring to creation here, right? Um, Here in Exodus, he is referring to the creation episode in Genesis and saying, no, God worked for six days. He rested on the seventh. He set that day apart. This is set apart for his followers, and he does it in the paradigm of creation. But in Deuteronomy, we also see this Sabbath concept discussed. It's in chapter 5, verses 12 through 15, and it says this. 
Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord our God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, or your male servant or your female servant, or your ox or your donkey, or any of your livestock for that matter, or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So in Exodus, we see the Sabbath in the context of creation. So keep the Sabbath because God, the one who created this earth, your creator, has set this apart for you. And here in Deuteronomy, we're reminded, God, the Redeemer, the one who brought you out of slavery, set this day aside from you. For once you were in slavery, not given a Sabbath, worked, slaved every day, but I redeemed that part of your life and I have set this aside for you as I delivered you from that situation. So we see the Sabbath being painted very vibrantly in two ways, like Sabbath to remember God the Creator and Sabbath to remember God the Redeemer. We see them in two different places. So why do we Sabbath? Because God created this. He provides for us, and He has redeemed us. He has brought us out of slavery, and this is a reminder of what He has done, who He is, and that He's done that for us as his children and followers of him. It's not just some religious, like, ceremonial, like, cool, today's my lazy day. But, like, no, this is to remember, like, God, the creator, loves me enough to set this aside. And he is the redeemer as well, and to set aside a time to remember those things. It's awesome. <clears throat> you need a Sabbath, it's rooted in creation, it's rooted in redemption. God sets that aside for us, a gift to remember who he is, what he's done, but also to remember the rest to come. He continues to allude to what's, what's coming. Now, oftentimes we may not like to recognize this, but in verse 9, it says that you shall do all your labor on six days and rest one. It doesn't say, should you choose to maybe work occasionally, make sure to take a day off. We are created to work. He says, when you work, like work six days, take that Sabbath, remember who I am. But God created us to work. Even back in the garden, there was responsibility, there was work. There's work. We'll talk about that over the summer. We're going to do a sermon series about this. But God created us to work. Work hard for the glory of God and worship him and remember who he is and what he's done for us on that seventh day. So what do we learn about God from this? What do we learn about him? He is a working and a resting God, and he is creator and redeemer. And those are the things we're to remember him for. That's what we remember him for. So the fifth one in verse 12. Honor your father and your mother, not just on Mother's Day, that your days may be long in the land of the Lord, or the land that the Lord is giving you. <clears throat> honor your father and your mother. God commands each person to give honor to their mom and dad. Now, for some in this room, this may be a hot button, right? Maybe it's like, well, yeah, but that one's not for me. You don't know what my childhood was like. You don't know my relationship with my parents. There's some messiness. There's some baggage there. <clears throat> but let's unpack what this actually means so that we have a greater context to understand this. The word honor implies acknowledgement of the weight of something. It doesn't say, like, flawlessly obey every single thing until, you're, until your parents die that they ever say. Like, it says, honor them. Honor your mother and your father. So in this context, what this is implying is that you give proper weight to, and respect to your parents' position. You honor the responsibility and the weight they bear in their position as the ones who brought you into this world, raising you, rearing you, right, as your parents. There's an honor that there's a weight about their position and what they have taken on. The opposite of this would be to despise or scorn your parents, <clears throat> to despise or scorn them. Now, back in Old Testament texts, to do this would put you at risk of death and even by death by stoning. Um, this was the punishment listed with despising, scorning your parents, breaking this commandment. It's kind of dangerous. Now, for us, regardless of what we see to be the validity of that whole, like, putting to death for dishonoring your parents thing, 
The point of it is, is this was a serious thing, to honor your parents. Now, back then, there was more severe consequences, but nevertheless, God considers this to be something valued, something that he has taken the time to share with us as an important way to be relationally healthy um, with one another and to honor him. And it also illuminates how he sees authority in our lives, right? It's about authority. The position our parents have been given, according to Scripture, is to steward our lives towards him, to, to raise us in a manner that we could learn to follow him. And so there's some authority in that. And so simultaneously, simultaneously while God's telling us, hey, you need, to, you need to recognize the weight and the reverence that is to be you know, with your parents, it's also about the authority in your life, too, and him as an authority figure, like he's handing these things down to us. There's some reverence to the position of the God who's created us and redeemed us. There's, there's correlation there with both of those. So as much as we may struggle, some of us, some of us not, but relationally with our parents, I just ask you to, to ponder, what does it look like to have some respect and reverence for the weight of the position that our parents have had in our lives? And whether or not you feel like they have done a poor job or hurt you or whatever that is, what does it look like amidst that to still honor them the way that <clears throat> God brings honor? What does it look to, to see that redeemed in your life? Because ultimately, where our earthly parents may have fallen short, we have a heavenly father that makes up for all those iniquities, all those, those hurts and all those places, right? So at the end of the day, we still have a perfect heavenly father. So what does it look like to give some grace to our parents for the ways in which maybe we don't agree that they've done things? What does it look like to honor that they had a pretty heavy position in raising kids? Those of us who have kids in here, like, it's kind of a big deal. It's kind of hard sometimes or all the time, right? And to, to honor that and respect that and be like, you know what? It wasn't perfect. But man, I, I believe that at least at times you did the best you could, and I respect you for that. <clears throat> So what do we learn about God here? We learn of his authority. We learn of his provision. The clause at the end of this command provides motivation for keeping the commandment because it says that you will live long in the land that the Lord has given you, that you will live long in that land. It reveals, again, the generosity of God. It's not like, do these or you're going to go to hell. It's like, do these so you can continue to live in the land that I've given you so that my blessings and my presence can continue to be among you. It's about generosity. <clears throat> it's not about stinginess. It's not perform so that I can give you any sort of nugget. It's like, no, no, let me continue to be generous. Just continue to walk relationally healthy so that my generosity can continue to flow on you. <clears throat> so for those of us in this room that are parents or parent figures, either to biological children or spiritual ones, right? Maybe you're discipling, mentoring younger folks. What does it look like? for us to imitate God, that, that we could bring honor by imitating him and how he relates to us. Instead of trying to rebel against whatever our own earthly parents' relationship has looked like, putting that aside, honoring that, respecting the weight that they had, and walking forward trying to imitate the perfect parent instead of walking forward in rebellion or reaction to ways that we may have been hurt or feel like we are wronged. Let God the Father be the paradigm for parenthood in our lives, not some reaction or rebellion against our earthly parents that we've experienced. Does that sound good? That's the heart of what's going on here. Now we get into some pretty concise ones. Chapter 20, verse 13, the sixth commandment. You shall not murder. Well, what is there to say about that, Pastor Chris? Well, let me tell you. <clears throat> This commandment is expressed with one of eight Hebrew words for killing someone or something. There's eight Hebrew words that could have been used, so it's probably worth looking at why the one that was chosen was chosen, right? <clears throat> the word that was chosen includes intentional killing, premeditated killing, as well as accidental killing. It includes all those in the essence of that word. The word for murder in Hebrew is specific for putting to death improperly, for selfish reasons rather than with authorization. That is what the essence of this Hebrew word would be. With this in mind, this could be translated into our language as do not kill unlawfully. Don't kill unlawfully. The reason it's important to know this is, and we're not here to debate this today, but there's lots of what ifs and what if this and what if this around this commandment, right? 
Um, <clears throat> you know, we're, we're coming out of, <laughs> we actually haven't come out of it, but the election's over, this political debate. And one of the big things was Second Amendment firearm stuff. We hear that a lot in Oregon because people like guns around here. Um, but like, okay, it says don't murder. What if somebody breaks into my home? I want to have a gun so I can protect my family. Or what about my brothers and sisters or friends in arms, right? Military people. What is this saying? But like, there's all these what ifs in these special circumstances that people always want to debate about this one with. <clears throat> you know, popular movie last year was Hacksaw Ridge. And we had a guy who chose not to carry a firearm based on his faith because he didn't believe that that aligned with his faith. Now, there's plenty of people that, that would differentiate with that. But given the season we find ourselves in and that this is a big part of the narrative and debate going on in our world, I think it's good to look like, what does the Hebrew say about this? And it says it's about intentional premeditated killing, accidental killing, putting to death improperly for selfish reasons without authorization. It's about the unlawful killing of somebody. This isn't in, in any way advocating for anything. It's just this is what the essence of the Hebrew word is there. <clears throat> so what this is saying to the original audience is that no Israelite acting on his own has the authority to bring judgment and death on anybody. No person acting on their own can go forward and say, you know what, you broke that commandment, so I'm going to put you to death because I'm going to be the judge in this scenario. It's say that, that's, that's not okay. That's God's call. That's God's call. And it also shows us that life is sacred. God considers it sacred because at the end of the day, it's like, no, don't kill. Let, let me be the judge, right? Life is sacred. Humans were made in my image, we know from Genesis. They're made in his image. God considers life sacred. And as followers of him, being in relationship with him, following his word, we should consider life to be the same, to be sacred. <clears throat> Jesus took this to the next level, as he often did with the commandments in Matthew 5, saying that anger was like murder. Ooh, that's uncomfortable, isn't it? Anger is like murder. James also said that we should not curse people because people are made in God's image. Oh, man. So uh, a lot of times we hear people make the argument like, well, that was Old Testament, but the fact of the matter is that Jesus is teaching and those who walked with him and were teaching his word in the early church actually like is more robust than the Ten Commandments. It addresses more of the heart issue. He actually, you know, he talks about certain things and he makes them a bigger deal. Like, nah, this isn't just about killing. Like, don't have anger. Don't curse people because they're made in my image. Because life is sacred and that's not your call to make. So at the end of the day, this all solidifies the fact that God considers life to be sacred, life to be honored. And he is the ultimate judge because he is the one who created. It's not our call to make. It's not our call to make. But we must, and hear me, we must consider life to be sacred. The way we treat people, the way we interact with them, how we speak. <clears throat> We're all made in God's image. It's really clear about that. We can't water that one down. Verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. <clears throat> seems, uh, seems pretty cut and dry. Now, this, this commandment addresses sexual purity in the context of, of the Old Testament. This commandment is to promote the purity of the heart, especially in regard to the marital relationship. The purity of the heart. God continues to address our heart issues. This isn't just about the physical act of something. This is about the purity of the heart, the internal desire for something that's not ours. Will God provide intimacy or this thing for us in this area, or do we need to go try to find it ourselves? Who provides? Us or God? Us or God? Jesus told us, again, he stepped it up a notch, and he said, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery in their heart. Again, the underlying principle that God's addressing here is the purity of our hearts. It's not just managing our morals and our actions. He continuously desires to address our heart. So what does this command teach us about God? It reminds us that he's holy and he has a desire for his people to pursue holiness. Because the issues of the heart, that comes down to holiness, right? Like somebody can think, oh, they're a good person. They, they have good morals because of what they observe our actions to be. But God says, no, it's not just about your actions. It's about the holiness of your heart. How are you pursuing me internally? How are you allowing me to shape and work on your heart? Work on your heart. 
God is not trying to spoil your fun with commandments like these. He is trying to help you be relationally healthy with him and with others. On the campus, that's one of the things we hear the most when it comes to these commandments, right? God just is no fun. He just doesn't want me to have any fun. He just keeps saying, like, be sexually pure and stuff and, like, and no, don't steal and all this. Why does he want to spoil my fun? Nah, it's not about spoiling your fun. It's about making you a healthy individual in relationship with him and with each other. His heart is relational. <clears throat> God's commandments are for your good and for the good of others. Verse 15 you shall not steal. The steal is what taking what doesn't belong to you, right? Again, it's that provision thing. Do you believe that God's going to provide for you? Or do you believe that you need to take things in your own hands? Do you need to hoard and provide for yourself? Are, are you exercising poor stewardship to the point where what God has actually given you to provide, you're squandering, and now you have to go find a way to take what's not yours to make ends meet? This comes down to our heart and trusting that God is our provider, we see it with the Israelites, like they're hungry, stuff falls from the sky. They're able to catch birds with their bare hands. It seems a little miraculous, right? God continuously provides for us, <clears throat> but they also stewarded those things well. It's important that what God gives, we steward well. We don't squander. We're not wasteful. We honor him with what he gives us because <clears throat> poor stewardship may lend itself to an increased desire to steal and take what's not ours so that we can survive. God gives us exactly what we need in any given season to accomplish his goals and purposes in our lives. Some seasons may seem lacking, some seasons may seem in abundance, but any time he calls us to be good stewards of that so that we can see his provision and his heart to see us flourish. I know that some of us in this room, it doesn't feel that way right now. And some of us in the room, we've been in those seasons where it didn't feel that way, right? But God is faithful. He's faithful, and he will give you what you need. He will provide. <clears throat> and because God gives his people everything they need, we don't steal. We don't need to, because we trust that he's going to provide. Paul tells Timothy that the rich must not set their hope on the uncertainty of wealth, but on God, who richly provides us with all things we enjoy. That's 1 Timothy six seventeen. Ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. A near neighbor. This is that one that I jumped ahead earlier. Many summarize this commandment by just saying, that just don't lie. Bearing false witness, don't lie. And while this may be a good shorthand summary, there are a few points um, about this. Like the idea of legal testimony and witness is inherent in this Hebrew context here. So rather than providing false testimony, the witness should give honest and truthful testimony testimony. This idea, though, is not just limited to the courtroom, because the entire earth is the courtroom of God, right? Like, he sees everything. The way things play out day to day, wherever we're at, all contribute to our heart condition and the way we are relationally. So this isn't just about putting your hand on the Bible in the courtroom and making sure you tell the truth. This is about not providing false witness as to who God is, what the truth and honesty is in any given situation. <clears throat> Titus 1-2 says, it's impossible for God to lie to us. It's impossible. So in this commandment, we recognize the attribute of God that is his truthfulness and his goodness. In the 10th, in verse 17, it says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. <clears throat> this commandment, once again, highlights the twisted desires of the human heart. Apart from God, just the twisted desires to, to covet and want things that aren't ours and to always you know, think that the grass is greener on the other side, all those nice little sayings we have. Instead of having a thankful heart, the coveter desires what others have. We're not thankful for what God has provided. We're constantly wanting more and what is not ours. Again, this comes down to a, to a heart of believing that God can provide, trusting him with our innermost desires and that he... <clears throat> cares enough about us to give us what we need, that he cares enough about us that he's going to bring joy and fun times and, and stuff to do and create memories in our lives, that he cares enough about those things. He's not just here to kill the fun with these commandments, right? He, he wants to bring these things into our life, but he wants to bring them in in a way that's going to continue to direct our heart towards him and towards purity, towards wholesomeness. <clears throat> Notice that this, again, is not just about some outward, like, don't steal, don't take your neighbor's stuff, don't, like, 
you know, break into their house and take pictures of it because you want everything to be like theirs, or don't lust over their boat, or how nice their yard is, these kind of things. Like, this is about the inward part of our hearts. This is about our desires and how we direct our hearts and who we trust to fulfill those areas. Luke 12, 15, Jesus said, watch and be on guard against all greed because one's life is not in the abundance of his possessions. <clears throat> not in the abundance of his possessions. In Hebrews, we read about the need to live free from the love of money. It says, do not trust in your wealth. Do not have excessive anxiety about wealth. Do not be devoted to wealth. Don't focus on these things. Don't just want what's not yours. Be thankful. Have thankful hearts. <clears throat> so what? <clears throat> that's what Exodus says about these things. But what does the New Testament say about it, right? That's what we've been trying to do through this entire series. Like, okay, that's what, that's what it says in Exodus. How does this tie in to New Testament and to what's going on now? The righteous character of God through these Ten Commandments is alluded to time after time in the New Testament. We saw a couple of places where Jesus actually takes it to the next level. But this righteous character of God, those terms are important, is continuously reminded and brought to light throughout the New Testament. Authors often name the Ten Commandments in outline form or individually in books like Matthew, Luke, Romans, John, 1 John, Colossians, Hebrew, Colossians, Hebrews. All these books tie back into these things, and they expound upon them. So this isn't just something that was Old Testament. This is something that still matters. The early church was built on these foundations. Jesus taught these foundations. They show us how to live righteously, how to love God, and how to love others, how to pursue holiness. These things are all super important. <clears throat> worship team, you guys come up. And this good news leads us to our final concept. Jesus fulfills these things. Jesus fulfills them. You see all these things, it's great. Like, okay, here's, here's all these commandments. And yes, I get why that's important. But man, that's really hard, right? Like, how can I perfectly do all those things and have my heart directed in the right way with all those things? We can't. We, we just can't. It's impossible for us to perfectly live out those things. <clears throat> we know that the Israelites failed repeatedly, and we know that we fail at this repeatedly. Even the mediator Moses would show himself to fail at this. However, there is a greater mediator, Jesus, who didn't fail. He didn't fail. And that's the good news here. These Ten Commandments point us to our need for a Savior. They don't just point us to being like having this great religious resume of how we can accomplish everything. They point us to like, man, to be healthy relationally, to love God and to love others, like I need help. I need help. I cannot do this on my own. That's what it points us to. Galatians 4 tells us that Christ was born under the law to redeem those under the law. Galatians 4. He fulfilled the law in every aspect he paid the penalty of the law. He bore the curse of the law on the cross. He fulfilled all this stuff. We cannot keep this law perfectly, so we needed somebody that could do it for us. And Easter and the death and the resurrection and this entire narrative of, of Exodus as we've been studying all point to the fact that the people of God cannot perfectly live in the way we need to. Jesus came to bridge that gap for us. This law drives us to Jesus for forgiveness and for the fulfillment of the law that we can't provide on our own. And then from there, it's his spirit that empowers us through obedience to continue on day after day. <clears throat> the weight that these people must have felt as God came down and said, hey, here's how you love me. Here's how you love others. And he drops these Ten Commandments on him. The weight that that, oh my goodness, how? How? And the weight that then generationally would have followed them and that they would have been bearing over all these years is lifted from us as we turn to Jesus. The weight of all the pain and all the ways in which we've fallen short and failed in these and the weight of how we will continue to fall short and fail of these is on Jesus' shoulders as he went to the cross and died for us. It's not about our performance. Not, it's not about just us trying to manage our stuff. It's about recognizing that, yeah, you're right, I have no business trying to even like do all of these. No, I'm going to do my best. 
in order to glorify Jesus, but ultimately I rest knowing that he took this, that he dealt with this for me, and I get to live out of that place. And that's my heart for us here today. Our power does not come from perfectly living these things. Our power comes from knowing that Jesus gave forgiveness and he gives us his spirit to fill us and empower us to try to do the best we can. One step at a time, day after day, one choice at a time, whatever way you want to look at it, he indwells us. The presence of the living God indwells us, the word says, so that we can live this way the best we can. And we're going to come up short. And that's why we need others around us. Hey, you're good. Don't, don't fall into that. That's not who you are. That's not who you are. Keep going. Keep plugging along. That's why we do life groups. Hey, keep plugging along. I know this is rough right now. God's got you. We got you. This is family. Keep plugging along. Don't give up. Don't slip back into that. And we fail from time to time. Maybe we take a step back, but we're in relationship with God and others, and that helps move us forward because we're not just destined to fail. We don't just fall back into pits of despair and whatever our habits may have been. We get to fail. I think there's a book called this. Forward. We get to fail forward. We get to experience like, man, I was horrible at that. But through my relationship with God, through what Jesus did for me, and through this family, we get to move forward even in those times. And that is a beautiful thing. And that what, that's what drives me to be a part of a community like this. That's what drives me into my word so I can continue to understand more and more of who God is. Because sometimes that just doesn't make sense. Wait, you mean I can be just like unworthy of all these things that you meet me in those places and you help move me forward? What an awesome God. And that's the truth of what <laughs> these 10 commandments resonate. It's like, yeah, you can't do it. But we have an awesome God who loves you. And he wants to bear that weight for you and with you and move you forward and move you forward. He doesn't want to leave you where you're at. So Bree's going to come up. She's going to pray for us. And she's going to give us an opportunity through communion to reflect on this this morning.